uh, this evening I'm going to talk about the Wilbraham River and a little bit about the Wilbraham Fen. Uh, and I'm doing this, I guess, on behalf of the Wilbraham River Preservation Society, who've been trying to protect the river for the last 20 or so years. I thought I'd summarize what I was going to say early on <clears throat> so that you, um, as it were, get the message. Um, and basically the Wilbraham Rivers are uh, a couple of chalk streams. There are quite a few chalk streams around this area along the line of um, a bed of chalk geologically. They've been quite heavily modified because of the use of the land over the last um, century or so, but they're now in danger of drying out. And Wilbram Fen is an SSSI. That also has some issues in terms of protection and has a, a fairly interesting history. And to some extent, it's been overlooked, and that's been partly to its advantage uh, in some respects. So much of what I'm going to say is covered in a book which Desmond Hawkins, the late Desmond Hawkins, wrote back in uh, the 2000s. Um, we used to sell this book for a fiver <clears throat> to raise money for the society. Um, but these days, we're actually giving it away for free. You can download the PDF uh, off the website. Uh, if you um, look through the different pages. And this is a very detailed study of the fens and the rivers, and you'll find more detail than I'm going to give you tonight in this book. I recommend it if you're interested. I'm going to talk about what is essentially the Little Wilbram River, briefly, and the Great Wilbram River, or what represents it now. They join downstream of Hawk Mill Farm and form what becomes Kwai Water goes under the A1303 bridge to Kwai Mill. <clears throat> and there are three SSIs associated with the river, the Wilbram Fen, Great Wilbram Common, and Fullbourne Fen. Now, if we go back in time, it's quite difficult to find decent maps or evidence um, of any form about the rivers before about 1600. But there are a couple of maps. These are from the Cambridge Antiquarian Society we show fairly clearly what is likely to be the Little Wilbram River and the Great Wilbram River. And they were called Wilbram Parva and Magna and Fullborn is down here. So there is evidence of their existence back then. And you can see that they followed the line of what was the sort of the parish boundary, the hundreds boundary in those days. And parish boundaries have are very long lasting markers. And in this part of the world, they nearly always were uh, represented initially by rivers. A more modern representation is here in terms of the Wilbram River, and you can see the Little Wilbram River arising from springs in the woods at Wilbram Temple. And the Great Wilbram River arises from springs at the end of Fleam Dyke, Shardellow's Well, and a couple of adjacent springs, and there's actually another one up here uh, on the Gogs. And these have been around for a very long time. What's different, though, is the Little Wilbram River has not changed a huge amount in its alignment since the Middle Ages, but the Great Wilbram River certainly has. And it had a completely different route until relatively recently. And if we go back into the Middle Ages before the drainage of this area, there was a mere sitting uh, roughly where the SSI is now, and the river drained into that and then drained out of it to go towards what is now Kwai Mill. So historically, mills were very important. And in the Doomsday Book, for example, Kwai had about four water mills uh, itself. But in terms of the rivers we're talking about tonight, there are four important mills on the system. And they were in descending order because each needed a head of water to run. And so the levels and the height of the water was very important. So you'll be familiar with um, probably most of these. Fullborn Mill no longer exists. Hawk Mill is now, of course, a farm uh, where David White and Eve live. Kwai Mill is now a hotel and still has a wheel stuck in the middle. And Load Mill is the only, the only functioning mill still on the, on the system with the lowest level. This is um, a sketch from Desmond's book uh, that was drawn by uh, Pat Nutbourne. If we look at the Little Wilbram River, one of the earliest maps, 1768, um, this is a map really of Newmarket and the adjacent heath and villages. But right at the edge of that map, I looked it up in the records office last week, 
right at the edge of the map is this section, which shows the Little Wilbram River quite clearly, and it shows it largely in its current position. But we do know that sometime in probably the uh, 17th or 18th century, it was diverted into the new cut, which you can still see. And that was done because it's higher and it lifted the water level to provide uh, more power for Hawk Mill. Apart from that, not much has changed in the Little Wilbram River <clears throat> uh, over the, the years. And so I'm not going to talk a great deal more about the Little Wilbram River. And what I'm going to direct you to is the website we've set up recently, uh, a new website, because on that there's a film. Uh, we made a video of the river last year when the river was full. And this is a sort of 20 minute journey down the river uh, with explanations of the various features and some of the history. So I recommend you have a look at that uh, for a more detailed uh, view. And I can't really play the video. I could have just turned the video on and walked off, but, <laughs> but I'm afraid I'm not doing that. <laughs> so the Great Wilbram River is more interesting in the sense that it's now abandoned. And here's a section of the abandoned river. This is by Herring's House. Herring's House is just here on the left. On the right, and including the river, is what's called the Parish Acre, belonging to Great Wilbram. And at the end here is the bridge, which all of us slow down uh, when we go over it between uh, Great Wilbram at this end and Fullbourne at this end. This is a nasty sort of narrow bridge uh, that when a lorry goes over it, you certainly don't want to take your car over it at the same time. But that's an important place, as it's the only section really of remaining river with water in it. If we go back to before the Enclosure Acts around 1800, there are some quite detailed maps made around the time of the enclosures. And this is one of them from Fullbourne Historical Society. It's the 1806 pre-enclosure map. And I'm gonna zoom in. It looks a little difficult to understand as it's all rather gray and brown and green, but you'll realize what I'm talking about in a moment. Fullbourne Mill I've identified here and the lines around it represent waterways. This is Fullbourne. Here's Station Road, and up here the road, the Sharp Bend by Lacey's Farm, and the Sharp Bend which runs across past Silver Trees and Herring's House towards Great Wilbram. So if I superimpose a Google map, aerial map, you can see how that matches up. And here's the road, and here's the route of the river, largely, which we'll discuss in a moment. You can see the rest of Fullbourne over here. So that's how they, they match. And if I superimpose the waterways now, when we zoom in, you'll see that it's quite complicated. This is what it looked like before the Enclosure Act. And this is probably what it was like in medieval times. There are a series of springs, probably another one over here. And there's quite a tortuous route of the water to the mill. And interestingly, by this time, the water from these two sources, Shardlow's Well, the end of Fleendike, had been diverted to the mill because we know, or we're pretty sure, this is the original route of the Great Wilbram River here. So at that time, the mill was taking most of the water at the top level. However, what's interesting is if you read Desmond's book, he looked into this. About 1808, the Enclosure Acts were implemented and they paid off the mill owner with 200 pounds to lose his milling rights and they demolished the mill. And they did that because they wanted to improve the drainage. A lot of this land was, quote, swamp and very soggy. So in order to lower the levels, they had to abandon the mill and pay him off. So if we jump forwards a few years, this is 1836. It's the first edition of the Ordnance Survey map. You can see I've highlighted the same area here. It's not to the same, it's not to the same detail. But what it does show you is that all of those, this is the mill, all of those original waterways have now been regularized. They've put them into ditches and they've cut nice new ditches around the fields. So the mill's no longer working and the original river course is present. And you can still see the two main sources, Shardlow's well up here and the one up here from the Gogs. 1900, another 70 years later, the same format is still here, basically. We know the mill has no longer functioning. But what I've shown you is in green, all the low level ditches that were created to drain the fields. What's interesting is right up to the 
source here. There's a ditch running down the edge of the field parallel to the river, just literally to the right of it. And then another ditch appears on the left, which is now next to Fullbourne Nature Reserve, runs through it. And drainage off the field here went under the Great Wilbraham River. If we go on a, uh, upwards towards what is now the railway, because the railway appears in 1852, you can see that the green lines denote the lower level drainage of the fields, which goes under the river here. And another source, there's another spring actually out here by the railway, ran into the Great Wilbraham River and then downstream towards Hawk Mill. Now I'll come back to this in a moment because things do eventually change, obviously. If we go further up above the Wilbraham Road, or the, the road between Fullbourne and Great Wilbraham, past what is now Silver Trees, the river used to run along the hedge line here, the parish boundary, and it used to run along this hedge line, which you can still see, and join the Little Wilbraham River downstream of Hawk Mill. But certainly in the Middle Ages, again, 15, 1600, we don't know exactly when, this was diverted into Hawk Mill to augment the Little Wilbraham River, which I haven't marked, which comes in here. Again, all modified to provide power uh, to the mill. This modification here into the Great Wilbraham Common, no one really understands what this is. It's called a mill halt on the enclosure maps. And I've researched this and not found a good explanation. Desmond speculated um, when we discussed it some years back as to whether it was to raise the water level and in some way provide a, a buffer for the mill. It seemed plausible, but I'm not sure it would really elevate the, the levels much, or whether it was used as a means of providing access for cattle on the common uh, for water. No one, no one really seems to know what it was about. So if anyone does have any historical information, I'd be interested. We zoom in on Hawk Mill, the farm. If you now, nowadays, you walk down past the windmill here, along to the corner, round through the farm, and then down this footpath here to a corner where it says no entry towards what it was Coles Green Farm. And then you walk round here by the hedge. What you don't realize is you, were, you are walking right next to what was the Great Wilbraham River in the edge of the field. And it was quite big. You can see it was quite a bit larger than what is, the, what is now the Little Wilbraham River. Evidence for this existing actually comes from a bizarre uh, photograph that I don't know how Desmond found this. This is a Luftwaffe reconnaissance photograph from 1940. Uh, and zoomed out, you can see the mill halt. And if you follow the river, you can see it tracking into the back of Hawk Mill. And you can see the footpath I've just identified here running along to the hedge line. But here's the Great Wilbraham River running into the back of the mill, joined by the Little Wilbraham River on this side. Now, an aerial photograph of that now, Hawk Mill is here, the windmill's here, the Little Wilbraham River comes in here. And if you look carefully, you can see a band of chalk here, which represents pretty much the site of where the Great Wilbraham River came in. And it ran on this side of the footpath through this field and along down to the edge of the common land. This is the common land hedge. I used to think it must run in this ditch, but it didn't. The ditch was part of the Enclosure Act's drainage system. The, the Wilbraham River ran in this field. And if we go back to 1929, there was, and certainly in this photograph, a lot of water. This is the mill race at the back of Hawk Mill. This must be several feet above the level of the water that is there now when there's water in the river. You can see ducks. And those of you who know Stuart Wilson, who lives in Little Wilbraham, uh, Stuart remembers um, that there were eels and pike in this mill race, and he swam in it as a child. So within living memory, there was a lot more water around. Things changed quite quickly after 1929 because the mill owners got into litigation uh, with the council about who was sustaining the water levels uh, in the Great Wilbraham River uh, because they weren't sufficient to drive the mill from about the level of about the time of the Second World War. 
In fact, they never really resolved that. There was a big argument. No one could agree about whose responsibility it was. And as a consequence, uh, as you'll see, things changed quite dramatically for the Great Wilbram River. So here in 1960, we're back to Fullbourne again. Here's the two sources, the regularized ditches, now all feeding the Great Wilbram River. But by 1970, we know this was intact on the 1960 OS maps, but by 1970, it's all changed. And because a lot of the land on the left side here, and also both sides of the river was waterlogged, they did a soil survey in the 1950s, which eventually uh, resulted in this fairly radical transformation of the, the whole system. So the red line, dotted line, shows you the original route of the Great Wilbram River, which you can trace now on any map because it's the parish boundary. What happened was they cut, cut it in half with this ditch where the tunnel was originally draining the field system. And all the low level field ditches have been joined up and the water from the sources is pushed into the field ditch on the right here, not into the river. Everything joins at this point in this corner. And then it all drains across into this, this stretch here, which is called the Fullborn New Cut. And that existed, this original drainage of a low level system existed probably in the 1700s and possibly earlier, but it was improved and dug out and cleared uh, in the Enclosure Acts of around 1800. Now, if we zoom in on this little corner, it's just quite interesting. If you walk around here, you can walk through the nature reserve, out through a gate over a bridge, along to the corner, and then up towards Fleam Dyke. In this corner, you will see uh, this little connection of the water system. This is where it all changed. What's labeled now as a drain was the, was the river. And originally, the, the, the other source, um, the other spring fed here, these two originally joined and went along the dotted line, which is the, the root of the old river. Now they're pushed into this field ditch on the other side uh, and the river bed still exists. With Richard Townley's permission a few years ago, or last year in fact, I waded along here to see what you could still see of the, um, of the river bed. It's pretty overgrown and has a lot of debris in it, but you can identify the shallow impression, the sort of um, shallow curve of the riverbed all the way along here through the trees. If we go further up in 1960, the original plan I showed you before, by 1970, of course, it's all gone and abandoned. And so this gets filled in, all this stretch here down the side to the common land is filled in and converted into farmland. And all of the Great Wilburn River is now diverted into this full-born new cut, which joins, whoops, joins the, the river, uh, the Little Wilburn River at the footbridge, some of you will know. Uh, from walking up along the side of the river. So if we look, this is a photograph looking back from, uh, from Hawk Mill. Uh, so over here is um, Silver Trees and Herring's House. This is the road uh, to Great Wilbram at this end. The railway's over here somewhere. So the river came in from this corner and went along this mill halt, which you can still see and walk ground and then came across Great Wilbram, halfway up the common and into this uh, stretch here, pretty much along the hedge line, up towards um, Hawk Mill Farm, or Hawk Mill originally. So I suppose for a lot of us, the question is, given uh, that original history and the amount of water there used to be to feed four mills, where did it all go? Well, there's some obvious answers to some of that. So. Vermoyden drained the fens in 1630, further up the Bedford level and some of the other important drainage acts. And then the enclosure acts around 1800 also influenced the whole thing. A lot of public drains were put in place and many of these are still the awarded drains that South Cam's district council have to come along and maintain. And they sometimes need reminding. So, at that time, a lot of land was drained for arable use. And in fact, the Fullborn Mill, which was knocked down in 1808, was replaced by the Fullborn Windmill, which no longer exists. In around the mid 1800s, of course, steam engines turned up. So they improved the efficiency of the water pumping to drain the fens fairly significantly. So that's another contributing 
factor to the reduction of the groundwater level. But perhaps most pertinent in the last hundred years has been the abstraction of water. And in 1890, at Paws Well, a full-born pumping station was opened. And although it closed again in 1921 when they opened the larger station at Fleam Dyke, it was resurrected for a while after the Second World War. I think ran to about 1960 before it was finally closed uh, and converted into offices or whatever it is now. So interestingly, people realized as Cambridge expanded that the abstraction of water was having some effect on the local uh, streams and um, particularly the chalk streams. So around that time, the, the Lodes Granter groundwater scheme was proposed. Some of you will remember, remember that. We'll come back to it in a second. In terms of the drainage, I just put a quick reference into the home post to remind people that actually the land shrank quite considerably. If you've been up to home fen and seen the posts, which are still there, the, the peat shrank something like three or four meters or more, I think probably more than that. They originally knocked an oak post in level with the ground and then replaced it with one of these metal posts, uh, which came out of the ground as the peat shrank around it. And it's estimated that the Wilbram Fen peat shrank by about two meters uh, when all of this drainage was carried out. So I'm not gonna read this, but I'll let you read it because you can read it quicker than I can uh, say it. But these are ab some abstracts from the brochure that we were circulated with in the 90s for the groundwater scheme. And I'll just draw your attention to the fact it's designed to improve the water environment to the north and east of Cambridge, as well as providing more water to meet the increasing public demand. Well, we're still in a rapidly expanding part of the country. How did this work? Well, interestingly, they did lots of modeling. What it involved was digging or sinking boreholes into the aquifer further away from the ones they were using, and then pumping literally in pipes water into the headwater springs of the various chalk streams that were threatened by the abstraction. So you can see there's quite a few of these. It cost about two and a half million to, to do this and was completed in 1995. So the question is, has it, has it worked? Well, I'm going to cut a very long 20 years short and say, not really. <laughs> and perhaps the best example of that is the Greater Cambridge Chalk Stream report, which was produced last year. They didn't tell us they were going to do this, but they actually chose the worst possible month, probably for some years, to come and look at our rivers because they had dried out. This is October 2020. So here's the road bridge by the lanes um, between the two villages. You can see, rather like it is now, actually a fairly low level, but it was completely dry. This is Hawk Mill, the outflow from Hawk Mill uh, Farm. And this is the bridge underneath the A1303, it's dry. So it, the river was completely dry between Hawk Mill and Kwai, completely dry. So their assessment of our river, of course, wasn't very good. And they said, well, if there's no water, I'm not sure we can do much about it. So the good news is we've, we have um, remonstrated with them saying this isn't really a representative uh, assessment because you did choose the worst possible time. So they, are, they have come back to look at it again. And the encouraging news is thanks to one of the, the um, a member of the society who's been monitoring the flow all the time, this is Tony Gorin, many of you will know. Tony's been monitoring the levels and feeding back to the Environment Agency about the augmentation scheme. And this year, 2021, there has been water in the river all year, uh, partly because it was such a wet year last year, I think. So we're waiting to see what will happen in 2022. You might think, well, what was it? Abstraction, rainfall, pumping? So I'll show you some figures. And of course, it's difficult to work all this out, but the Environment Agency are doing a whole load of groundwater models again. And we're going to meet them in the next few months to discuss these. But I'll just show you some of the data we've managed to obtain with freedom of information requests. So this is the total annual abstraction of water within five kilometers of the springs feeding both rivers. And in 2020 here, you can see it's quite high. You can also see they turned on a new borehole in 2018, 
and there are actually five or six boreholes here, not just Fleam Dyke. Fleam Dyke is the bottom one here, and the levels from Fleam Dyke, if anything, have gone down slightly. When you add together all the other boreholes, actually, we're about 15 million, whatever these are, possibly cubic meters, actually. And if you look back to when they started the scheme, it was around 10. So it has gone up quite substantially, the abstraction. We also managed to get the Fleam Dyke annual rainfall. So was it a particularly dry year, 2020? And the answer is no, it wasn't. What about the amount of augmentation water that was pumped? Well, again, was it particularly low? It looks about average. Now, of course, we're not dividing it out by months of the year, and there's more subtlety than this to this than I'm suggesting. But it does look a little suspicious that the amount of water being abstracted is having an influence. And in fact, the Environment Agency have admitted that the scheme is not working as it should, and that there are effects on the groundwater level, which I think is um, fairly self-evident. Now, addressing all this in the future is important because there's a group called Water Resources East trying to do this. They've been working for eight years already to produce a plan for the future of the water supply and taking into account the effects on the environment. Now, this plan is surprisingly complicated, and I'll show you a little bit about that in a moment. Um, but it is interesting that there is work going in into this in terms of how to manage the demand. And they're expecting the water demand to double, double by 2050 in this area because of the expansion of Cambridge. I'm not going to go through any of this, but you can just see how complicated this stuff is. But to cut a long and complicated story short, all our water comes at the moment out of the aquifer. In the future, finally, it's going to come out of a reservoir. And there's going to be some transfer of water from other places where they have more water. It has taken many years to reach this stage of a reservoir. So if you're interested in pursuing this or learning about this in terms of what's going on, uh, hopefully we've put quite a lot of information on the website. There's also a lot of reports and documentation and information about the history, as well as Desmond's book, which is well worth a look. Uh, if you want to see what's happened to the local rivers. So I'm going to move now to briefly to Wilbraham Fen. Here's one of the residents sitting, standing on a tuft in the middle of uh, one of the units of the SSSI. If we go backwards in time to 1797, this is the enclosure map for Little Wilbraham, which I found in the records office last week. And if you look at the map of the fen, it's very like it is today. So long drove, short drove, parish ditch running around the edge, which defines the parish boundary. And the river defining the parish boundary on this side between Fullbourne and Teversham. Quai Mill, Hawk Mill, and the land distribution is quite similar to the current um, distribution of land with the exception of the fact that most of it was owned by the church back in 1797. Not a surprise, I suppose. If we jump forwards, in 1951, the Nature Conservancy designated a huge area enclosing the whole of the Wilbraham Fen, part of Teversham Fen, and part of what's actually called Fullborn Fen, part of the top end of Lacey Land, as it stands now, designated it all as an SSSI. Now, back in those days, there wasn't much protection of SSSIs. And in fact, since then, it's been shrunk on two occasions down to its current size, which is demarcated here. This is off the DEFRA magic map system. The surrounding land actually is mainly in countryside stewardship schemes, so it is being managed. But the SSSI is, is now this block here in terms of its distribution running along the edge of the river. So the SSSI um, was designated because of its vegetation and plant life. And the last survey, I don't think they've done one since 2004, talking to Monica O'Donnell at Nat Natural England, but they did a very detailed survey then showing the distribution of the different types of uh, plant life uh, and various uh, types of 
um, vegetation. There's a lot of water in the bottom section with the reed beds. Uh, and one of the things perhaps uh, we didn't think about or wasn't thought about at the time was this area has become really quite an important bird uh, site and uh, one of the best sites for all sorts of uh, birds. Back about 10 years ago, we were lucky enough to um, spend a morning uh, with uh, the late Michael Holdsworth, and he went and did ringing every year in the middle of the SSSI, next to, if anyone had been in the middle, an old Land Rover. And you can see after a few days, he's already reached 355 birds that he's ringed uh, off his mist nets. Uh, he'd weigh them and ring them. You see a little ring here on this side. So there are all sorts of birds. I'm not a great bird expert. I take the photographs and my wife works out what they are. Um, but there's quite a lot of interesting bird life down uh, and around the SSSI. You geese to go with it. And of course, there's some animals too. So you probably have seen these guys. There's a reasonably large, probably 10 or 12 deer roam between the SSSI and between Little Wilbram and Great Wilbram uh, over the, the sort of green corridor that exists through the arable fields uh, and around the river. The SSI actually requires maintenance, and that's to pr protect the water pools for ideally for bird life. And the reeds need regularly cutting. When I was on the parish council in the 90s, we used to have a, a guy come and cut the reed for thatch, uh, which earned some money for the parish council. That stopped a while ago. But the good news is that uh, choir states, um, Henry Barber and Ellen Francis, have, through one of their stewardship agreements, uh, started to cut the reed. And this was last year. They've got this incredibly complicated reed cutting machine. Uh, which is a rather specialist device, which they're cutting different segments of the SSSI each year. Uh, and that helps to maintain it. At the moment, they're, they're burning the straw, the, the reed, because you have to cut it for several years before it would be usable for, for thatch. The other good news is that um, there is a plan for a nature network which has been proposed by Cambridge Past, Present and Future and the Wildlife Trust. Uh, and this is proposing a nice green network right around Cambridge, linking as many of the green areas together to provide corridors for the wildlife. And they've produced a very detailed report, which you can find on their website, which talks about how to improve and expand Little Wilbram Fen and how it's linked to the other SSSIs, uh, Great Wilbram and Fullbourne. So that's a really positive development, and uh, we're obviously very supportive of, of that. We'll see how that fares in the next few years. It links with the Wiccan uh, 100 vision and a few other developments further south and around the rest of Cambridge. The bad news is, of course, Cambridge is expanding, and more recent developments do to some extent threaten the SSSI and the ideas of the Nature Network linking up towards uh, Anglesey Abbey and Wiccan. The Honey Hill Wastewater Treatment Plant is going to cause a huge amount of disruption while it's being built. Uh, and there's a proposal with the Cambridge Eastern Expansion to relocate Newmarket Park and Ride. And there are three proposed sites. One of them is here, very close to Island Cottage and the edge of the SSSI. So we're hoping if, if it has to be relocated, they use this location at the western end. But if you imagine a 24 hour site with lighting, noise, traffic, uh, that's not really uh, an ideal arrangement. The impact zones marked on this map, actually again from DEFRA, show uh, what developers have to take into account if they're gonna go near an SSSI, but actually how much they take, you know, they take account of it and talk about it whether they actually respond and do things to protect it is a, is a separate question. So the future is relatively uncertain, although there's more interest in chalk streams and there's more interest in preserving our wildlife and the green areas around Cambridge, but it will need some activity and action in order to maintain them. So I'm gonna end by just um, acknowledging the various 
sources for the maps and things that I've used here, in particular Desmond's uh, book, and just leave you with a reference again to the website uh, at the end. So that's it. I'm I'm finished. So if there are any questions, I'll try and answer them. <laughs>